Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Capital Medical Center 15th IM Powered Postgraduate Course. Thank you for that kind introduction. Topic for today is weight expectations, obesity, and weight management. These are my disclosures. The objectives are the following, to describe obesity prevalence and trends, impart the health risks and consequence of obesity, as well as discuss the modes of management for obesity. In the Philippines, about 27 million Filipinos are overweight and obese. And of these, 40% of Filipinos 20 years old and above are overweight or obese. And in 2019, about 41% of Filipino adults were physically inactive. The risk factors of obesity in the Philippines are poor diet, consisting of high dense food, inadequate nutrition, failing food systems, and limited physical activity. This slide shows energy homeostasis and weight regulation as shown in the left slide, right side of the slide. The energy intake and energy expenditures are tightly coupled through integrated central nervous system networks and the peripheral organ hormones that act in consort to regulate feeding behavior and energy homeostasis. The energy intake is governed by five major CNS networks, as shown here, such as your homeostatic hypothalamic centers, the reward centers, emotion and memory, attention, as well as cognitive control. The afferent neurohormonal signals from the peripheral organs are the following the gastrointestinal tract, the vagal afferents, pancreas, which produces or secretes insulin, the adipose tissue with leptin, and the skeletal muscle or myokines. Energy expenditure is comprised of resting energy expenditure, such as your cardiorespiratory activity, maintenance of cellular processes, physical inactivity, which is your volitional activity or exercise, and as well as non-exercise activity thermogenesis. We also have diet-induced thermogenesis, such as the energy required for processing and distributing macronutrients. And don't forget the caloric losses through the GI tract or the kidneys. All these are caused by a myriad of genetic, developmental, and environmental factors that may result in obesity. So the caveats in obesity are the following. It is a complex, progressive, and relapsing chronic disease. It is not insufficient or lack of self-discipline. It has multifactorial causes. Thus, there is a pervasive weight bias and stigma. And there is heterogeneity in response to any treatment. Studies have shown that multiple therapies with different mechanisms of action and lifelong treatment is necessary. So these are the complications of obesity. The dark blue bars are those secondary to metabolic complications such as your cardiovascular diseases. We have stroke, dyslipidemia, hypertension, coronary artery disease, pulmonary embolism, as well as your congestive heart failure. You also have type 2 diabetes mellitus or prediabetes. They are prone to thrombosis, gout, nafold, gallstone, infertility, as well as cancer. 
The light blue bars are secondary to mechanical complications, which are your asthma, chronic back pain, your incontinence, knee osteoarthritis, physical functioning, and your sleep apnea, as well as your gastroesophageal reflux. While the green bars are secondary to your CNS complications, and they are your depression and anxiety. There were are several guidelines for obesity management, and more are coming out from 2014 up to the present. And here is the recommendation of the Canadian Adult Obesity Clinical Practice Guidelines, as well as the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists Comprehensive Clinical Practice Guidelines for Medical Care of patients with obesity. There should be five steps in the patient's journey. First is to ask. This is clockwise. As you can see, number two is assess. Three is advise. Four is agree. And five is assist. Step one, ask. You should ask permission. Would it be all right if we discuss your weight? Asking permission shows that you have compassion and empathy with your patient. It builds patients and physicians' trust. Second is to assess their story. What are the goals that matter to the patient? So you have to look at life events and weight gain. You have to ask questions about patients' life events that coincided with weight gain, such as smoking sensation, medication initiation, pregnancy or menopause, job loss, change in marital status, and others. Go deeper with regards to diet and activity. What is the extent of the daily physical activity? sleep habits and difficulties, food preferences, the frequency and quantity of meals. And you have to check the psychological assessment with regards to mood, the anxiety disorders, presence of post-traumatic stress disorders, and even eating disorders. I have mentioned to you the complications of obesity, and this you have to check through the review of systems. What about the patient's weight loss readiness? Is the patient motivated? Does she have social support, psychiatric status, presence of stressful life circumstances, time constraints? A detailed obesity history enables one to develop a tailored treatment recommendation to address individual patient needs. So, we have to have a checklist of weight-related complications. As I've mentioned earlier, metabolic complications, cardiovascular complications, and organ-specific hormonal and mechanical com complications. Okay? With regards to weight-related complications that are metabolic, you have to check for your fasting glucose or A1C, or if the patient has prediabetes, a two-hour oral glucose tolerance test. For metabolic syndrome, you have to check for the waist circumference, the blood pressure of the patient, fasting glucose levels, triglycerides, and the good cholesterol levels. For type 2 diabetes, if the patient is not diagnosed, you have to do your fasting glucose, A1C, and symptoms of hyperglycemia. For patients with the possibility of NAFL or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, you have to do your physical exam if there is hepatomegaly and check for the liver function test. With regards to cardiovascular complications, you have to check for the lipid levels for the assessment of this lipidemia, sitting blood pressure for hypertension, and physical examination of the heart, as well as review of system. For polycystic ovarian syndrome and female infertility, you have to do a physical exam. 
no? Check for the presence of acanthosis nigricans, okay? Uh, signs of diabetes. Check the review of system, menstrual, and reproductive history. Again, for male hypogonadism, a detailed physical exam is important. For obstructive sleep apnea, you have to check the neck circumference of the patient and the history of frequent snoring. Again, for asthma, osteoarthritis, urinary stress incontinence, and gastroesophageal reflux, you have to do a detailed review of system and physical examination. Now, then you have to classify the obesity of your patient using your body mass index and weight circumference. Now, as a review, your body mass index is your weight in kilograms over height in meters square, okay? And you have to check the presence of weight-related disease or complication. So here is a tabulation on the B. MI values so that you can know whether your patient has normal weight, stage zero or stage one obesity or stage two obesity, and below are the values for Asian, specifically for Filipinos. The normal BMI is 18.5 to 22.9 kilograms per meter square. If your BMI is 23 to 24.9, you are overweight. And if your BMI is between 25 to 29.9, you have obese one, okay? And if you have a BMI of more than 30, you are obese two, okay? Now, we have done this before. We checked the medical history, did a thorough physical examination, then you do the clinical laboratory test that I mentioned earlier. Check the review of system, emphasizing weight-related complications. After all this, then you can make a disease severity based on the Edmonton obesity staging. Where in zero, although your patient is obese, there are no obesity-related risk factors, physical symptoms, psychopathology, or functional limitations. For stage one, which is mild, the blood pressure is greater than 130 over 85 millimeters mercury. Fasting plasma glucose is pre-diabetes, and the total cholesterol may be elevated. So with your triglycerides and your good cholesterol is low. There is shortness of breath during physical activity. While stage two is moderate, wherein your patient is diagnosed or treated with hypertension or untreated BP greater than 140 over 90, okay, with type two diabetes or untreated fasting plasma glucose greater than 126 milligrams per deciliter, diagnosed with dyslipidemia, the patient also presents with gout, depression, fatigue, urinary leakage, low back pain, joint stiffness, and the patient is reported to be generally sad or with fair self-reported health. While in the stage three, which is severe, your patient has now chest pain, myocardial infarction, calf pain during exercise, stroke, shortness of breath when sitting, or sleeping, cardiomegaly. And this, your patient is often depressed or with poor self-reported health. So step three is to advise the fundamentals of care. The foundation of treatment of obesity is basically lifestyle modification with diet, exercise, together with behavioral modification. Adjuncts are your pharmacotherapy and bariatric surgery. So lifestyle modification on the right-hand side of the slide are the dietary modifications. So you have to promote breastfeeding from birth to six months of age. So advise your patient to eat a variety of nutrient-dense food rich in calcium and fiber. So as you can see here, it's mostly limit intake of foods and beverages, 
intake of calorie dense foods. And remember, patient must be advised to eat breakfast every day. So portion control with correct food choices and then to participate in family meals five times a week. Limit the eating out, especially in fast food restaurants and allow a maximum of two hours per day only for screening time. And on the right hand of the slide, the left hand of the slide is the physical exercise, moderate intensity exercise for 20 to 60 minutes daily. Choose low impact activities such as walking, swimming, cycling, step aerobics, and then this is followed by strength training program at least two times a week. Remember, our patient is already obese, so they, they could be, they have some difficulty in walking or doing some exercises. So you should start slowly and gradually progress the intensity and duration. Advise them to find an exercise partner to help keep them motivated and consistent. And the most important thing is to set realistic weight loss goals. No more than one to two pounds per week and stick to a healthy calorie controlled diet. So this is the recommendation from the Endocrine Society. As you can see here, this the new treatment paradigm is to treat the weight first. So for diet, any diet, is feasible as long as the patient will adhere to it. And the exercise is 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity more than two days per week, okay? So as you can see here, if the patient has dyslipidemia, you have to advise your patient to be on diet to decrease the saturated and trans fat intake, increase the intake of omega-3, okay? and moderate unsaturated fatty acids, okay? And to take, avoid simple carbohydrates, okay? If your patient has hypertension, then they should use the DUST diet wherein it has decreased sodium intake. For patients with impaired glucose tolerance or diabetes, you have to advise increased fiber intake with a glycemic index diet, okay? So, We'll talk about the medications later, but suffice to say that you have to treat this lipidemia with statins, hypertension with ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Now, with regards to psychological and behavioral interventions, psychological is the cognitive approach to psychological change. You have to manage the sleep of your patient. There should be six to eight hours of sleep the time of sleep is very important because sleep less than six hours can induce hyperglycemia and more than eight hours can also induce hyperglycemia and to avoid stress. Psychotherapy, if necessary. For your behavioral intervention, they recommend multi-component psychological interventions, goal setting, self-monitoring, and problem solving. Okay, so you have cognitive therapy as well as values-based strategies. So when do we start with pharmacotherapy? What is the criteria for using approved medications? So as mentioned earlier, pharmacotherapy is an adjunct once the energy deficient diet increased physical activity and behavior modifications seems not to work as expected. Okay, so for patients with a BMI equal or greater than 27 kilograms per meter square with equal or more than one comorbidity, pharmacotherapy is recommended. As well as for those with BMI equal or greater than 30 kilograms per meter square with no comorbidities, pharmacotherapy is already recommended. Okay, so here in the slides, you are shown figure one and two. It summarizes the main mechanism of action for current anti-obesity drugs used to treat obesity. So we have now 
currently five anti-obesity medications like liraglutide and semaglutide, which are GLP-1 agonists. Your liraglutide, the approved one for obesity, is three milligrams per, per day, which is given once daily. And semaglutide at a total dose of 2.4 milligrams weekly. We also have Orlistat, okay? And a combination of nalretroxone and bupropion, okay? As well as your fentermine and topiramate. They are the approved anti-obesity medications for long-term use by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, okay? Especially for treatment in adults with either BMI equal or greater than 27 kilograms per meter squared with comorbidity or those with BMI equal or greater than 30 kilograms per meter squared without comorbidity, okay? So if you look here, your naltrexone is actually an opioid antagonist. It is an appetite suppressant. It disrupts the beta endorphin mediated Okay, POMC auto inhibition, while your bupoprion, which is located here below, okay, there are a combination, bupropion, okay, uh, it's, it's an antidepressant and it's mainly used to help in smoking sensation. However, it has an anorexic mechanism of action, which involves the inhibition of dopamine and reuptake of your norepinephrine, okay? Another drug is your fentermine here. As you can see, this is an appetite suppressant effects through interaction with biogenic amine transporters. So it enhances your norepinephrine, dopamine, as well uh, as your serotonin release in the central nervous system. And then the other drug is your topiramate, which boosts your thermogenesis and acts as a neurostabilizer. In patients with diabetes, we now have your GLP-1 agonist. As mentioned earlier, it acts periphery in the periphery with regards to your uh, gastrointestinal hormones, your GIP and your GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide. And it also acts in the central nervous system. So it promotes satiety, okay? And it is available now here in the Philippines. So patients with obesity on pharmacotherapy should have frequent patient follow-up. That is the key. So for the first three months, they should visit you monthly and thereafter at least every three months. The best weight loss outcomes is seen with those with frequent face-to-face -face visits. So an average of 16 visits per year. And there is dual benefit of weight loss and glycemic control for those with diabetes mellitus or prediabetes. Aside from metformin, we now have your glucagon peptide 1 agonist, okay? Liraglutide 3 milligrams in adult was approved in 2014, okay? And in 2020, it was approved for use in, patient, in children 12 to 17 years old. Semaglutide, although the highest dose we now have is uh, 0.51 milligrams, in 2021, semaglutide 2.4 milligrams was approved in the States, and it's coming over soon in the Philippines. And we also have the new class of your SGLT2 inhibitors, okay? So for those patients who are obese with type 2 diabetes, you should know which of these medications will promote weight gain, such as your insulin, sulfonylureas, other insulin secretagogues, and your TCDs or thiazolindiones. So once you have a patient who is overweight or obese diabetic, you have to embark on a weight loss plan start with diet and exercise. You can maximize metformin. If there is contraindication or intolerance, you can add in your GLP-1 agonist, liraglutide, although uh, now we have semaglutide, which is at an advantage because it is given only once weekly. And you have to taper your insulin and sulfonylureas until you can discontinue it. 
you also have to taper your thiazolin diol. Instead, you consider the use of your SGLT2 inhibitors. Again, on patients who is on insulin aid and they do need insulin because um, you can start with basal insulin and avoid premix insulin to prevent hypoglycemia and further weight gain. And then you can combine this with metformin or your GLP-1 agonist. Or you can combine your basal insulin with your DPP-4 inhibitors. When your patient is obese but with hypertension and has depression on insulin and a sulfonylurea, again, you add in your GLP-1 agonist. You have to taper your insulin and sulfonylurea. You have to taper your TCDs and add a DPP-4 or an SGLT2 inhibitors. And if your patient is on beta blocker, you have to shift them to an ACE inhibitors. So if pharmacotherapy seems not to be working, then your last option is your bariatric surgery, okay? So this should be totally discussed with the patient because the consequences is also severe. So the surgeon and the patient should discuss it themselves. And if you look at the rates of equal or more than 10% total body weight loss at one year, as shown in this graph, of course, those who underwent bariatric surgery has the highest rate of weight loss, 68%, 75%, and almost 98% with your Roux and Y surgery. And even your intragastric balloon will have a 60% weight loss, okay? And if you look at your anti-obesity medications, okay, Again, bariatric surgery has the greatest weight loss, and this is followed by your GLP-1 agonist, okay, uh, which is your semaglutide at 2.4 milligrams. The dark blue one here is your tirsepatide, which is 15 milligrams, a combination of your GLP-1 agonist and your gastric inhibitory peptide. Okay, so it's coming over in the Philippines in the next few years. Okay, and in comparison of the weight loss in rats, as you can see here, um, the weight loss is greater in rats compared to the humans because they had shown that the rats have uh, increased metabolic uh, energy expenditure compared to humans. Okay. So step number four is the patient and the physician or the caregiver should agree on the goals of treatment. They should collaborate on a sustainable but personalized action plan, okay? You should gain the trust of your patient. So during follow-up and reassessment, you should focus on incremental, personalized, and small behavioral changes. Sustained behavior change is important to overcome many challenges, such as cravings, habits, availability, or social pressures. Follow-up sessions usually is repetitive and relevant to support the development of self-efficacy and intrinsic motivation. So my key points are the following. In conclusion, the prevalence of obesity is increasing in the Philippines, especially during the pandemic. The causes of obesity are multifactorial and may vary from one person to the other. Remember that this is not secondary to insufficient attitude to lose weight. And the focus of obesity treatment is not weight loss, but health gain. Diet, exercise, and behavior modification is the foundation of any weight management plan. The success of obesity treatment can be measured in the reduction of symptoms, not only by the actual weight loss, which ultimately will reduce the signs of the disease. So thank you very much for listening.